The two years that I spent in Louisville uh, was, a, was a mixture of things, but um, one of the real joys of that time was getting to work with and getting to know your president, uh, Dr. Greenway. I count him a dear friend and someone that uh, my convictions and his line up exactly. And that's uh, it's just a joy to be here with you all and be here with his leadership uh, in place. I do have an announcement. There's going to be a going global lunch at 1130 in the Naylor Student Center. And this will include stories from Central Asia and a question and answer time. Uh, Central Asia is my home. It's the place that I regard as where I'm really from. Both of my children list a city in Central Asia on Facebook as their hometown. And uh, it's already been a joy to be here in that I have already had a chance to hang out with some folks that I literally have worked with for decades on the field. And when you, when you go through battle like that together, it's just a, it's a sweet and precious thing. I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. We're going to be looking at the closing of Luke's account of this gospel, verses 36 to 49. And I'll be reading from the ESV. Luke 24, beginning verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieving for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Let's pray before we go any further. Father, it is perhaps the most solemn and serious thing in life to proclaim your word to your people. Because those are two things that you hold very, very dear. And Father, none of us are adequate to that task. I pray then that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit you promised to your followers that night in Jerusalem, that that same Holy Spirit would speak to me and through me and to all of us, uh, that you would take your word and use it as a, as, a, as a tool, as an instrument in your hands to reshape us to be more like Jesus, to challenge us and to equip us to better engage in his service. Father, only you can do things of eternal significance. So we ask you to do that now in Jesus' name. Amen. When you've been overseas for a long time, coming back to the States can be a bit of a shock. As a matter of fact, we, we tell people before they go to the field that reentry shock is actually in some ways worse than the initial culture shock. You expect culture shock when you go somewhere else. You don't expect it when you come to a place you used to call home and suddenly realize it isn't home anymore. And I have to tell you that one of the biggest forms of reverse culture shock that my family and I have experienced is actually going to church. Now, you need to understand something. Um, my first term, I was part of a new church start that consisted entirely of Muslim background believers who were refugees in an Islamic country. I was the only man in the church who had not at least been beaten unconscious for his faith. All of them had received death threats. Some of them were subsequently killed. My, my kids grew up thinking that was normal church. That's what a normal Christian is like. In fact, one of the things we realized when we brought our kids to the States, and, and by the way, since I'm standing here in Texas, I just need to go ahead and say, I have a son who is an Aggie, so we, yeah, it always happens. It always happens. Um, but I tell you what, when, when, when my son went to A&M from overseas, it was like, whoa, what's going on here? And... Um, 
my kids actually had never met a nominal Christian. The least committed Christians they had ever known were missionaries. Think about that for a moment. The least committed Christians they had ever known were missionaries. And one of the things that has been particularly disturbing in looking at American church life is the realization that not only is discipleship not that intense as we were used to on the field, but that in far too many of our churches, the subject of global evangelization, the subject of missions, was simply a marginal agenda item. It was just one other special interest among many. You know, you're interested in the flowers for the communion table, and you're interested in global missions, and those are like on a level with each other, as though they were of equal importance. Just one special interest relegated usually to a committee, often, far too often, without pastoral support. And something I've learned being around American seminary since coming back is that even in seminary, missions can be regarded as reserved for the few, the proud, the slightly unhinged. Uh, that was certainly my experience when I was a student in seminary. I went to Gordon Conwell Seminary. Uh, that was back in the day when, if you believed in inerrancy, uh, you didn't go to a Southern Baptist school. And uh, I was at Gordon Conwell. I was the chairman of the Student Missions Committee. And I discovered that once I took on that title, people avoided me. It's as though you don't hang out with Zane. If you do, you might end up in Djibouti. It'd be an awful thing. You don't want that to happen. So we'll just let them be off in the corner, and we'll attend to the serious theological subjects. That's the attitude. It's the attitude you run into. And so many students who are serious about theological disciplines or pastoral ministry often regard the one missions course simply as a requirement to get out of the, out of the way. And having taught that course at one of your sister seminaries, I certainly know that to have often been the case. Now, I know well that neither your administration nor your faculty feel that way, but I fear it too often can become an attitude that arises in the student body. What's clear from this passage is that Jesus did not think you could think about biblical studies or systematic theology without thinking about missions. And I want you to see the link in this text. In this passage, he links them together in a way that simply can't be separated. So let's look at this passage and see where it takes us. First of all, let's look at the context. Um, my, my, my doctoral work is actually in the area of hermeneutics, and I teach hermeneutics to all of our new missionaries who are coming through our field personnel orientation. It's a passion of mine, and one of my biggest passions is never, ever, ever look at a text out of context. So let's look at this one in context. This is the night of the first Easter. You know the story. Jesus had risen from the dead. The message had been given to a godly group of women who typically were completely ignored by their male co uh, colleagues. Peter himself, along with John, had actually gone and looked at the tomb, seen what had happened, and yet Peter was still clueless. And that night, that afternoon probably, actually, two of the disciples, one of whom was named Cleopas, we don't know the name of the other, were walking seven miles from Jerusalem to their town in Emmaus. They're talking over what's been happening, and they're clearly grieving Jesus' death. They've heard the women's story, but they don't believe it. Then Jesus shows up. They don't recognize him. They don't know it's him. But he walks up, says, what are you talking about? And they say, are you clueless? Don't you know what's been going on? And they tell the story of the death of Jesus and the report of the resurrection that they clearly don't believe in. And Jesus gave his famous rebuke. He says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? That's verses 25 and 26. And what follows then is the most amazing Old Testament survey course that has ever been taught. Don't you wish you were there? We're told, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They get to Emmaus. They urge him to stay. They share a meal. He takes the bread and breaks it, and suddenly they recognize who he is, and he disappears. They run seven miles back to Jerusalem, report the news, and learn that he has appeared to Peter. And that follows then the scene that we've just read from the scriptures. So what do we learn here? First thing we learn very, very, very clearly is that the Old Testament points to Jesus. I, I still remember being told by a preaching professor of mine, never preach a sermon that Rabbi Pratt could preach. That was really good advice. So to you preaching students, let me say the same thing. Never preach a sermon a rabbi could preach. We're not moralists. We're 
messianists. And the scriptures point to Jesus. And the New Testament is very clear that the Old Testament points to Jesus. Jesus is, after all, according to the New Testament, the second Adam, the true Adam, who remained true where Adam failed, who was the founder and head of a new redeemed human race, the true humanity, because he was the true man. He is our Sabbath rest. It's through him that God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are fulfilled that all the families and all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He is our Passover who has been sacrificed for us. He is the true Son of God, the true Israel whom God called out of Egypt. Out of Egypt I have called my son. He is the true tabernacle and the true temple, the presence of God in the midst of his people. He's the true Yom Kippur sacrifice, the one that actually does atone for sins in the way that bulls and goats can only point toward. He's the prophet promised by by Moses. He's the eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek. He's David's greater son, the king who sits on the throne forever. He's the forsaken one of Psalm 22. He is the suffering servant of Isaiah. He's the son of man from Daniel. He's the one greater than Jonah who came alive out of the grave after three days. He is the ruler who would come forth from Bethlehem, prophesied by the prophet Micah. And every one of these is a New Testament reference. The New Testament writers looked back at the Old Testament and they saw Jesus all over it. Why do you think that is? I think it's because of what we just read. See, that's a pretty powerful lesson. You're going to remember it and you're going to pass it on. And as you're preaching yourself, as you're discipling new believers, what's the content of that going to be when you don't yet have the written New Testament? It's going to be what Jesus taught. And Jesus is saying, here, look, guys, this is what I've actually been telling you all along. The Old Testament was all designed to point toward me. And you need to as well. And what that means then is that if you are an Old Testament scholar, and I pray that many among you are, that you always need to look at it in light of Jesus. When the apostles use the Old Testament in this way, their point was that the Old Testament points us to Jesus. When I'll specifically, and this is, a, is sort of the focus of what Jesus is saying here, the Old Testament points to the cross and resurrection. This is where Jesus himself makes his focus. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And so, yes, there are many prophecies pointing to Jesus in the Old Testament, but specifically he has been sent to be the suffering servant, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And here things like the Passover, Yom Kippur, the suffering servant of Isaiah, seem particularly appropriate, and this would form the critical core of the proclamation of the apostles to the world. This is the gospel. And I don't care how many times you've heard it, you need to hear it again. God created a perfect world and put a perfect man and woman in it. But our first parents rebelled against God by disbelieving him and then disobeying him as a result. And everything was messed up as a result. All that is wrong with the world stems back to our race's rebellion against God in the person of Adam and Eve. But God stepped in to rescue us from the catastrophe we had created. God became a man and his name was Jesus. His name was the Lord saves. And, as we've said, he succeeded where Adam failed, resisting temptation, living the perfect life we should have lived. He died on the cross as our substitute, bearing on himself the wrath that we deserved. He rose again, killing death and crushing the serpent's head. He reigns forever and he will come again. And preachers in this room, this is your message. Apart from this, you have no message. This is what you are being sent into the world to proclaim that Jesus Christ is God himself in human flesh who died in our place to bear the penalty for our sins, who rose again victorious over sin, death, and hell, and all who repent and put their trust in him are reconciled to God. And apart from that, apart from the cross and the empty tomb, you literally have nothing else to say. Let me add, not just this is your message preachers, this is your message missionaries, this is what you're taking to the world. This is your message, Christian education folks, that you're going to train to people. This is your message, worship leaders. And thank you, guys. I love what you're, you're, you're singing. I was, I was in choir. It's one of the things that I miss. Uh, I don't have a solo voice. I need to be safely buried in a choir, but I still love to do it. But this is your message. You are not going to entertain people. You are going to proclaim the cross. And apart from that, you have nothing to sing. That's what we have to keep in mind as the center of what 
we're here to do. I'm not saying that we don't train people how to live in light of the cross. Certainly, we don't just proclaim how you get saved and then leave people to figure it out on their own. Yes, you teach people how to be faithful disciples of Jesus, but always in the context of being a disciple who has laid down his pride or, and, and her self-will at the foot of the cross and embraced Jesus. But what I want you to see as well as that is that the Old Testament that points us to Jesus, Christ crucified and risen, also propels us into global mission. You will notice here that Jesus connects the gospel that saved us and the imperative to missions in the same breath. It's like it doesn't even pause. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and that on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Boom, it just all flows together. You can't embrace the one without embracing the other. He is as certain that it's written meaning the Old Testament, the Word of God, that repentance and forgiveness of sins be proclaimed in his name as he is that the cross and resurrection are true and are the heart of our message. And indeed, thus it is written. See, the Great Commission is not a bolt out of the blue as it's so often treated. Remember we said earlier that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise that through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the nations and all the families of the earth would be blessed. How on earth could that happen apart from the Lord Jesus? The ruler that Jacob promised would come from Judah, to whom would be the obedience of the peoples at the end of, of Genesis. He's the fulfillment of that. Speaking of worship, the call to universal worship that resounds through the Psalms, all is fulfilled in Jesus. It's not enough that just one nation praise God. That's not enough. And so we hear the Lord bless us and keep us and cause his face to shine upon us. Why? That your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. Let the peoples, plural, praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. For Psalm 96, we're told to declare his glory in our church building. No, declare his glory among the nations his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. I would actually go so far as to say two things. One is that evangelism is itself an act of worship because we are proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the purpose of evangelism is to recruit for the choir. I mean, we're recruiting for the choir of heaven. So you guys just have a leg up on everybody else. Everybody else is going to join you in the presence of the throne of Jesus. The, the Psalms themselves point to this. And as you read through the prophets, you begin to see a picture. You see a picture of a prophecy of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming. That's the day God is going to step onto human soil, to, uh, the, 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 this human world, and make things right. It's clearly, as you read through the prophets, the day of Messiah. It's also the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And most significantly, along with all those things, it's the day of the ingathering of the nations. And I could quote you more scriptures than we'd have time to go through that point to this. But just to keep in mind what Isaiah, what God said through Isaiah in speaking to the servant of the Lord, it's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the, the, uh, the tribes of Jacob and restore those of Israel whom I have kept. I will also make you a light for the nations that my salvation may come to the ends of the earth. That's the theme here that with Jesus comes the world. That with the salvation that saved you and me comes God's agenda to bring in all the nations and all the peoples of the earth. And the Old Testament points to this every bit as much as it does to the cross and the empty tomb. In the perspective of Scripture, the one leads inevitably to the other. It's no surprise then that Jesus actually gave the Great Commission several times. I don't know if you've noticed that. But as you read through the Gospels and Acts, you realize that Jesus did, didn't say it once. It was, oh, by the way, I almost forgot. If you think about it, you might go tell other people about Jesus. No, he says it over and over again. If you read Matthew, you read Luke, you read John, you read Acts, and you discover that, God, that Jesus said it several times in several different ways at several different points during the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. The rest of the New Testament, in fact, is then missions literature. 
I mean, Acts is the story of the advance of the gospel. The theme is set by Jesus in the first chapter, Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And that's the pattern then that the book of Acts follows. The letters of the New Testament are missionary literature. I mean, okay, we'll let the New Testament faculty deal with it as well, okay, guys? But it's actually missions literature. I mean, that's part of the mission strategy of the apostles because they wanted healthy believers in healthy churches on the mission field, and so they wrote the letters to that end. It was in a missionary setting that the whole thing was written. And even as we come to the book of Revelation, the missionary purpose of the atonement is stated for us in Revelation 5.9. You were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And the fulfillment of that purpose of that mission is given in Revelation 7.9, where we're told that there will be people from every tribe, language, people, and nation standing before the throne. You cannot believe and preach the gospel and escape its global implications. You can't separate them. I want to note just two more things quickly before we make application. First of those is that Jesus says that you're to proclaim it, but he also says very clearly that a response is required. Uh, Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be preached. Repentance and faith in the New Testament are inseparable. They're like two sides of the same coin. Here Jesus summarizes the whole thing just by saying the word repentance. Other times you have just faith. Sometimes you have them both together. But saving faith is repenting repenting faith. And the problem with casual Christianity is that too often we think that you can believe something is true without having any impact on your life. Jesus doesn't know that kind of faith. Repenting Saving faith is repenting faith. And if there's no conviction of sin, no grieving over it, no putting it to death, there is probably no salvation. The second thing I want you to note is the link here with the Holy Spirit. That goes back to what I said about the prophets. The prophets said that the day of the Lord will be the day of the Holy Spirit, the day the Spirit is is poured out. You will remember that Peter quoted something along those lines from Joel in his first sermon at Pentecost. And it's It's a link made by Jesus in John's gospel where he said, receive the Holy Spirit, which goes hand in glove with, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. It's the link made again by Jesus in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of evangelism and missions. You want to know if the Spirit really is involved in a movement? Those people share the gospel? Are those people concerned about the nations? If they're not, I don't care how dramatic it may look, I would question whether it's actually the Holy Spirit. Just as the evidence of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit in a person's life, the evidence of the Spirit is also the presence of a passion for evangelism and missions. And where either one of those is missing, then you have reason to question whether it's actually the Spirit of the living God who is at work in those people. It's also, though, impossible without Him. We can't engage in this work in our own strength. Let me apply this now to our lives here in an academic community. The first of those should be obvious by now. I plead with you to see the link between biblical studies, systematic theology, and missions. I plead with you to read the Bible as a whole in the context of its grand narrative, not as a grab bag of random texts to pluck out as you need. See Jesus woven through it. See the gospel woven through it. And also see God's global mission woven through it. And study the great themes of the Bible that we know as systematic theology in their missionary setting. I think as we read the Bible, we come to realize eventually that theology, worship, and missions cannot be separated. If our study of theology does not leave us in a state of awe, drive us to our knees and lead us to worship, then we probably haven't understood what we've studied or we've we've studied it with an unregenerate heart. Worship is the inevitable consequence of a proper understanding of biblical systematic theology. But they both must also then terminate in mission. They don't just drive, they drive us to worship God and they drive us to seek to bring others to worship God as well. And those three have to go together. Please don't try to separate what God has joined together. God has joined biblical studies, theology, worship, and missions inseparably as one, and you cannot separate them. Please don't try.
Look at your studies in seminary and your ministry in the church through missionary lenses. Next, I would say to all of you who are going out to be preachers, preach and teach the cross in the empty tomb. Yeah, there's a lot of glorious stuff in the Bible you need to teach. And there's a lot in the Bible about how believers should, should live, and you should preach and teach those things, but never stop preaching the cross in the empty tomb. It's the only way unbelievers can be saved. It's the necessary context for instruction about the Christian life. That's why the epistles are written the way they are. You notice they all start with theology and end in action because the action divorced from the theology just becomes legalism. It's so easy for us to become Pharisees. And so easy for us to train Pharisees in moralism if it's not rooted in the gospel. One of the debates in the missionary world is about obedience-based discipleship. It's a phrase I hate because my discipleship is not based in obedience. My discipleship is based in grace. It's based in Jesus. It's based in the cross and the empty tomb. And all that I am to do, all that I am to obey, flows out of that and must be considered in that context. But next, you preachers, you teachers, you cannot preach the cross and the empty tomb without preach, preaching missions. Let me say it again. You cannot preach the cross and the empty tomb without preaching missions. Preachers, pastors, don't reserve missions for one Sunday a year, if that. Okay, it's Lottie Moon season. I suppose we have to. This, this one Sunday. Don't do that. I mean, if you're preaching through the Bible, which I hope you are, God's heart for the nations is scattered all throughout that Bible. And every time you come on it, preach it. Make it as regular a part of your preaching as it is a part of your Bible. It's all over the pages of it. It's the mission God gave his church to do. It's an inevitable consequence of the gospel itself. Integrate it into every component of your church life. Pray about it every time your church meets to pray, which I hope is every time your church meets. Pray about the nations. Pray about God's heart for the nations. Pray about the lost in your own community as you are praying for the hospital role. I, I, I heard a, a, a missionary doctor once say that in our typical churches, we spend more time praying to keep the saints out of heaven than to get sinners in. And while it is perfectly appropriate to pray to keep saints out, let's devote even more prayer to getting sinners in. Jesus put the gospel and missions inseparably together in this passage. Please keep it that way. But finally, and this is absolutely critical, I urge you to resolve the question yourself. What your role is to be in the mission that Jesus gave here. I mean, Jesus combined taking the gospel to the nations with the gospel that saved us. Jesus combined the command to take the gospel to the nations with the gospel that saved you. It's not, a, it's, it's not something that's just reserved for the few. It's something that all must consider. I think many, many preachers avoid it, and they avoid missionaries precisely because they're afraid if they get too close to it, they'll get called. Let me tell you something. If God does take you to the nations, there is nothing more glorious I can imagine, even if it results in your death. Nothing more glorious I can imagine. And I have never for a second regretted one day of the time I have spent in places that the State Department says you should never go. So consider the vastness of the need. Consider the clarity of the command and then flip the question. The question is not, should I be engaged in the mission that God gave his church? The, you, you should. The command is there. The question is not, am I called? Well, of course you're called, because if you're called to salvation, you're also called to a whole bunch of other things, including service in the fulfillment of the Great Commission. The question is, how are you called? And so rather than ask, am I called? Knowing that you are called, ask yourself, why shouldn't I go? I can tell you right now that at the International Mission Board, we are in the rare position that we haven't been in in a couple of decades, where we actually have more money to send missionaries than we have candidates to send. In one sense, it's a great position to be in, and in another sense, it's a horrible position to be in because the vastness of the need is overwhelming. Just to say something about the affinity that I had the joy of leading, Central Asia has about 360 million people in it. A really, a really um, 
sort of exaggerated estimate, a, a really optimistic estimate of the number of believers is around maybe um, 120,000, which means that Central Asia is point zero point zero two five percent evangelical. There is not a single reached people group in that whole affinity. Someone once asked me, how do you decide where, where a team is needed? And I said, there's a map, got a dart. Because wherever that dart would fall would be a place where people know nothing about Jesus. And we have way too few people. And that's just one affinity. There's so many others with, with similar sorts of needs. So in light of the clear command of Scripture, in light of the overwhelming need, ask yourself the question, why shouldn't I go where I am needed more? Why should I be content to stay where I am needed less? Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful to you for this seminary. I'm grateful to you for this faculty and these students. Father, thank you for the, uh, the love of your word that is here. Thank you for the love of your mission that is here. Thank you for the host of missionaries that have come out of this place. Father, I pray that you would raise up more and more. And Father, I pray that those whom you lead into pastorates, into other positions within local churches here in the States, would be passionate about global mission. And that those churches themselves would be fruitful mission-sending outposts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.